Heather. I'm Anna. I'm Kristen. And we're Watershed Ambassadors and we're here at uh, the Rahway River. We're going to do um, um, habitat and biological stream assessments today and we're going to assess the quality of the water to see how polluted it is. Um, we'll walk you through how that goes and that's pretty important because this Rahway River, um, it flows right into the water treatment um, center and that water that after it gets treated goes to all of the households in the area. It's used by lots and lots of people so it's important to see how polluted this water is and we're going to do that today. Yeah. So what's what's involved in a stream assessment? What are the you said a habitat and a biological? Yeah. So we're going to walk you through the process, but basically we're going to be looking at all of the bugs that are in this river. So we call them benthic macroinvertebrates, and they're the larval forms of a lot of flies and insects, but also some. Um, we're going to be looking at some snails and crustacean as well, and seeing what's there. If we get a good biodiversity of these guys, if there's a lot of different species all in one area, then we know that the stream is pretty healthy. So you want to explain to the camera what you're doing, Heather? Yeah, so I'm filling out the top of my biological assessment sheet, and then I will fill out the top of my habitat assessment sheet. So um, biological assessment is like Anna said before, where we find the insect larva, the benthic macroinvertebrates, and then we use what we find to determine how healthy the stream is. And the habitat assessment looks more at the stream itself and the surrounding vegetation to see is this a um, good habitat for uh, macroinvertebrates to live in to support other um, life that lives in there like other fish and then the fish support the, the ducks and it makes a nice whole healthy ecosystem so we're going to be assessing what's in the stream and what's around the stream and that's what our habitat assessment sheet has. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Can you tell me what you guys are about to do? All right, so we're about to assess this riffle area. A riffle is a place where you find a lot of rocks. Usually it's more shallow than this. This is a bit of an odd example. Hopefully you'll see better ones as we go on. Um, but basically, a lot of the macroinvertebrates that we're looking for like to stick or cling to rock sides. So what we do is we'll take our D-net, which is this, stick it down so that it's hitting the bottom or hitting a hard surface directly in front of a rock that we want to check. Kristen's going to stick her hands in there and see if she can get all the clinging bugs off of it. I'm putting my net downstream so that all of those bugs are going to go with the river as soon as they let go of the rock and go directly into my net. Then we're going to check the net and see if there's anything alive in here. <laughs> it's cold! <laughs> Do you feel anything, Kristen? A lot of moss and algae and stuff, yeah. I feel like sometimes you don't feel anything and then you look in the net and there's things there. So they hide. They're sneaky. So as I'm um, picking up and scrubbing the rocks, I'm moving them off to the side. So, when all of the big cobbles and rocks are out of the way, we're going to do some kicks into the net. Ooh. Check that out. Ooh, exciting. No, clams. I never get awesome. to see clams in my muddy bottom stream, so that's really exciting. Yeah, 
you saw all the, the clam shells earlier. So we were just wondering, oh, are there actually clams? Yes, there are. Heather, what do you have in your hand? I have a sip bucket. So once they're done doing their scoop um, and Kristen's done shuffling, they're going to empty their net into my sip bucket. And I'm just trying to keep it in the water so there's enough for it to rinse out. Because otherwise, it's going to be really hard <laughs> to catch the stuff. Right, so we have at least a Oh, look at all that stuff. There's like a mayfly or something up there. Whoa, look at Scud. Yeah, there's so much Two blue ice. Wow, you guys did great. Awesome. Cool. Put them in there. So, are you guys just rinsing out the macros now? Yeah. Yep trying to get everything that was clinging to this off of it, if there's anything alive. And we check it, I think underside, I saw a little. Um, is this, no, yep, yep, a salad. Yeah, this, this yeah. Nice. Um, oh, is this, yep, here's, here's a guy. <laughs> <laughs> cool, nice. Successful first scoop, yep. on the bottom of these streams are bugs and rocks, but sometimes, unfortunately, uh, there are some sharp things that end up at the bottom of these streams. So just be cautious when picking things up. We already found two large pieces of glass. Just don't stick your hands into the water without kind of being cautious.
so that was our fifth width measurement and now we're gonna go uh, do the depth with our meter stick. Now we're gonna take the depth measurements like I mentioned before we do five widths and five depths so we have our meter stick here and we're gonna go across the transect and hold it down and see where the water stops so this looks like five and a half inches. Got it. And then we're gonna have to convert it to meter. Never do math in the field. Nine inches. water's velocity right now and the way we do that is we measure out a 10 feet section of our stream and we will let the duck float downstream um, Anna's gonna stand on that side she's gonna release it I'm gonna stand on this side and catch it and we're gonna time how long it takes to get it from her to me and that will will have the velocity per meter per second What are you guys doing, Heather? We're trying to catch the eel Got and put him in this little container so he's not so stressed out in our bucket. There you go. Awesome. We wanted to show you guys that we caught a freshwater eel. samples in different parts of the river. Uh, they are now into this bigger sample which uh, has all of our macros in it. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to count and sort out all the macros that are in this bucket into smaller subsamples. So the way to do that is we take our container, we swish the water around here. If you want to take a closer look, look at our yummy soup of uh, river samples. We scoop it up and this is our subsample. So within this container there's going to be all different sorts of macros in there and we're going to try to find all of them in this one subsample. When uh, we exhausted everything like we couldn't find it, we can't find any more, then we take another sample until we reach a hundred macro, macro invertebrates. So yeah, let's get, let's get to it. So, this is called a daikon mosquito. This is how we identify certain things in the field. Um, in this case, we're trying to identify certain macroinvertebrates. So, we are trying to... Um, so, what we do is when we take one of the guys, we take a look closely at its features. So you start at the top here. Does it have a shell or no shell? No shell. No shell. So no shell, does it have legs or no legs? Definitely legs. Yeah. A lot of legs. There's a lot of legs. So when we go down to this um, bracket here, it's going to ask, uh, does it have more than 10 legs, four pairs of legs, or three pairs of legs? So we have to look very carefully. To me, that looks like 10 legs. I think this is a decapod. <laughs> what? <laughs> so, now, so now we've narrowed it down to these group of guys, which are our crustaceans. So you could either be a crayfish, 
a scud or a sow bug? Do we want to, before we reveal the answer, let everyone look at it and guess? <laughs> hmm. So crayfish are like little lobsters, right? But they're very tiny. Scuds are, uh, they're, they're at their side and they swim really, really fast. And these guys are, um, they have a lot of legs in their, what is it called? Dorso ventrally flattens. Dorso ventrally flattens. Dorso ventrally flattens. Yeah, that's a mouthful right there. So, yeah, so what do you think this guy is? And are all the answers in? Ding, ding. The correct answer is scud. Yeah. Which is also called an amphipod. Um, Ooh, we caught a leech in there. That's awesome. All right, so let's watch him. Ooh, that's exciting. That's so cool. He's like suction to the side. Come here. This is a leech. This is actually the biggest leech I've seen. So. Yeah. So they usually suck. Um, they have a suction end on one side that they attach to something, and then the other side will find a. Um, the correct place to basically bite. So usually the first time they suction to you, it's like they're gonna hold still to one place. Then they use their other end to like search around for a better spot. between the two caddisflies is this one's swimming on its back so it's it's nice and easy to see it has fluffy gills on the underside um, of its abdomen um, for the net spinners and the case builders don't have those fluffy gills like this guy here so Kristen what do you have this is just a case building caddisfly without the case wow called the net spinners, they actually create this silk thread that they will string between rocks and make a web, essentially. So as the water is going through, they'll catch all the little bits of good food in that net, and then they'll be able to come out and eat it. There's a sow bug. Wow. We should hold a sow bug and a scud right next to each other. Okay. Someone wants to also put a scud in my spoon. So we can see the difference there. Go ahead, Anna. Mitch. Um, yeah, so in here we have two different kinds of freshwater crustacean. We have a sow bug and we have a scud. The scud is the one who looks like he is currently sideways, moving his gills around. The sow bug is the one who is crawling around on the spoon a little bit more. So this is a mayfly. Mayflies usually have three tails, like that's a really good indicator. This one, he has just little stubs. Uh, most likely the tails fell off, um, probably through living his hardcore life. Um, but the way you can tell if you don't have the tails is if you look at its abdomen, you can see his little gills moving around. He's got some pretty um, obvious gills right there. That 
What do you have here, Heather? So this is a midge fly, another kind of larva that we find, one of our macroinvertebrates. Um, it has, it kind of looks like a worm. It has no legs. Um, it moves a little bit differently than a worm, and it actually has pro legs. If you look really, really closely, right under the head, it has a pair of pro legs, which are kind of like stubs, not fully formed legs. And then at the end of its body, it has little hooks. Um, so this is a midge fly. 14. What do you have over there, Anna? Um, right now, about 15 freshwater clams. 16, 17. <laughs> uh, these guys are actually probably invasive, a Chinese variety. Um, they, are, they are quite prolific, as you can see. This is all one species. Got a caddisfly. So then what are you going to do with that tally? What's going to happen to those numbers? Yes, so we're going to enter them into our calculating um, Excel sheet, which scores them differently based on pollution tolerance. Um, and after we enter all of the macros, it will tell us if our um, stream is healthy, undetermined, or stressed. Okay. And what does it mean, maybe someone can explain like, how do we know if some species are pollution tolerant versus not? Like, what does that mean? Yeah, um, so the different tolerances will tell us how healthy the stream is. If you have a species like a clam, um, they're pretty pollution tolerant. They can take a lot of pollution. So they're hardy, which is great, good for this species. Um, but if I'm finding in my sample nothing but clams, uh, it's probably indicative that the stream needs a little bit of help or at least is polluted. Um, on the opposite side of the spectrum, we found that one mayfly. Mayflies are not very pollution tolerant at all, they're very sensitive. So if you find mayflies in your stream, and a lot of them, it could be indicative that your stream is really healthy. What we really want is a good biodiversity. It's a fast moving stream and most we have riffles that we can see um, because of the rocky bottom. Yeah. Um, high gradient streams can also be called rocky bottom streams. That's and a good way to remember it. The soil content here tends to be very clayey and silty. Yeah. Um, though here it seems like we have a little bit of a sandy soil, which is fun. Yeah, very interesting. And then uh, low gradient, we also call them muddy bottom streams because they're more muddy bottoms. <laughs> There's more... Uh, <laughs> 
sand and sediment and and mud and clay. Not clay. Not clay. Um, <laughs> Lots of sand. But sand. It's and, a yeah. yeah low gradient moving. streams are slower moving. Um, they're the kind. If you step into them, you will sink down. That is a good indicator. <laughs> yeah. Not as many rocks. Um, but we have a high gradient stream today, so that's what we're doing. Um, first parameter is epifaunal substrate and available cover. Um, so our options are optimal, suboptimal, marginal, and poor. Yes. And there's a scaled number um, there uh, for each section. So optimal is 20 to 16, suboptimal 15 to 11, marginal 10 to 6, and poor is 5 to 0. Um, at the end, we're going to tally up all of these sections and score it out and just do an overall what is our impression of this stream. Yes. So if we were to rate this optimal, it would be greater than 70% of substrate has favorable, is favorable for epifaunal colonization and fish cover. I feel like it's not in the optimal range. I didn't see a lot of um, aquatic veg in the stream while we were in there. Mm -hmm. um, it's just along the margins. Not a lot of um, Fall, fallen logs. Yes. Yeah. Um, so suboptimal is 40 to 70, mix of stable habitat. Um, and habitat includes snag, submerged logs, undercut banks, cobble, or other stable habitat. We did have a lot of, I think it would be the higher end of suboptimal. Suboptimal maybe like, like a 15 or 14? Like a 15. 15. All right. Then we have an embeddedness, um, which is how embedded our cobble and boulders are in fine sediment. So optimal would be zero to 25% surrounded. Mm -hmm. Suboptimal is 25 to 50%. Uh, marginal 50 to 75, and then poor is greater than 75. Um, I think we're in the optimal, suboptimal. Yeah. Um, maybe low optimal. I think uh, we're definitely in the optimal range. There was quite a lot of embedded rock. Yeah. Okay. So. So, 16, 17. I think I'd give it a 17. I like it. Then we have velocity depth combinations. So for optimal, all four velocity depth regimes must be present, which includes slow deep, slow shallow, fast deep, and fast shallow. And I would say we have all four. We have that, yeah, yeah. we definitely do. You wanna give that a 20? Yes. <laughs> all right, then we have sediment deposition. Um, for optimal here, little or no enlargement of islands or point bars in less than 5% of the bottom affected by sediment deposition. Yeah, there was like no islands. Yeah. So oftentimes sediment will get loose in the water and then flow downstream and kind of collect and make these islands in the middle of the stream. We didn't have any of that here, which is awesome. Yeah, none of that on the sides. Um, I would say I would say maybe 19 just to be more realistic and not a full 20 because I think like this is a little bit maybe like this area but not really much so a 19 for that because it's so I optimal. think that yeah um I would give it a 19 I think you are right about this area that we're currently sitting on being a bit like that I think the bridge has a lot to do with that yeah um channel flow status water reaches base of both lower banks and minimal amount of channel substrate is exposed I feel like I feel like it's pretty full. It definitely is. Okay. Well, it rained the other it day. It did didn't rain. It? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the water level might be a little bit. Yeah. So give that a full twenty. Yes. All right. Channel alteration. Um, channelization or dredging absent or minimal stream with normal pattern that's the optimal. I think this is pretty optimal. Um, I mean, if you look downstream, there's a little bit of braiding going on. Mm -hmm. um, however, we do have this bridge, so I wouldn't put it at the high end yeah. of optimal. Um, we're not seeing any evidence of dredging for sure, because boats aren't coming through. Mm -hmm. Dredging is when they kind of tear up the bottom in order for more recreation to happen, or sometimes boating. Sometimes people just need to get down the stream. Um, and channelization is absent, which is awesome. And um, I'm a little surprised, honestly. Like, other than the bridge, I'm not seeing any channelization. 
I think maybe high suboptimal though because suboptimal does include the bridge mm. being present um, greater than the past 20 years. Oh, let's give it a 15. So then. a 15, a high suboptimal. Yeah. Channelization is if you're ever in a stream and you see that the walls of the stream are, instead of like a gradual bank margin, it's like a wall of stone. It looks like someone built these walls. Yeah. Someone's trying to stop the stream from naturally meandering as it wants to do. Uh, streams tend to curve, go back and forth and back and forth. Yes. And then our frequency of riffles. So. Optimal here would be the occurrence of riffles are relatively frequent and the distance between riffles is five to seven times the stream width. Um, the variety of habitat is key and streams where riffles are continuous. Placement of boulders or other large natural obstruction is important. So this is tough because our stream is really wide. Our stream is really wide. I felt like we had to walk a while to get to each to riffle yeah. in our little segment. Yeah. So we're only measuring within our 100 meters, really. Um, and within our 100 meters, there were only two spots that were really Yeah, and at like the riffles. very edge. So maybe maybe high suboptimal for that. Occurrence yeah. of riffles and frequent distance between riffles is 7 to 15 times the stream width. Yes. So like a 15 for that. Bank stability. So now we're going to score each bank individually. Um, and to do that, we face upstream. Um, what are you laughing at? I, I saw a bug on you and I took it off. Thank you so <laughs> much. You're the best. OK, so we look upstream. Left street uh, bank will be on this side. Right bank is on that side. So um, the first is stability, um, which has um, evidence of erosion or bank failure, absent or minimal, would be optimal. Little potential for future problems, event less than 5% of bank affected. Um, Suboptimal would be 5 to 30% of the bank has areas of erosion. Um, marginal is 30 to 60%, and poor is 60 to 100%. So I was looking before, I think that this left bank is a little bit iffy. It's pretty eroded and yeah. the right bank actually looks a little bit better. Um, I would say it's probably somewhere in either four or marginal for the left bank. Um, yeah. 60 to 100. I'd I agree with that. There's not, 60. there's not a very wide riparian zone so it's like all these trees are kind of in this small area. Um, the vegetation's not quite out yet because it's early spring. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, it's the first day of spring or is it the second is day of spring? It? Happy spring! Happy spring. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm worried that like if it does erode, which I think it might, these trees might start falling into the stream. Yeah, so we think, I'm thinking either a three or a two, either low marginal or high poor for the left thing. Uh, for the left bank, I kind of want to give it a three. Okay. Be a little generous. Yeah. And then the right bank is better. Um, mm -hmm. I think five to 30 in the suboptimal range sounds right for that side. Maybe like like a seven middle suboptimal. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Seven. Okay. And then we have bank vegetative protection. So this part is measuring the width of the, oh, just the presence of our native vegetation on both banks. Mm -hmm. um, so optimal would be 90% of the stream bank surfaces and immediate riparian zone are covered by native vegetation, including trees, understory shrubs, or non-woody macrophytes. Um, vegetative disruption, disruption through grazing or mowing is minimal or not evident, and almost all plants are allowed to grow naturally. So this side, I would say is pretty good. This is, that looks like some not weed. Um, where are you seeing not is, weed? Is that not this? This stuff right here? Um, oh, the, uh, the things that are left over? Yeah, like in this little Oh, bar you're right. Here. It is kind of bamboo -y. Yeah. Yep. So that's invasive. It's invasive. Um, I've almost positive that we passed some barberry on the way over yeah, here too. Yeah, we did. Um, 
Yep. Okay, so that's our left bank, and that's actually our better bank. Um, so maybe, let's see, what are the options here? So um, maybe 90% for suboptimal. Seven. Seven for left bank? Yeah. All right, and then right bank is worse. Um, <laughs> right bank is mostly Kentucky bluegrass yeah. uh, from people's lawns. Uh, we have trees. some oak trees, a couple maples, um, some knotweed, and then a yeah. very small bank mar margin in general in riparian zone. So I guess I would say maybe a three for the right bank. Yeah. And then last. Here's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> the last one is riparian vegetative zone width. So this is what I was trying to say before because I was jumping the gun. Um, so this part, we measure how wide our riparian zone is. So optimal is greater than 18 meters um, of riparian zone where human activities haven't impacted the zone. Um, Suboptimal is 12 to 18 meters, marginal 6 to 12, and poor is less than 6. So on our left bank, I would say this goes back for a bit. So would we sit, give that a full 10 for our left bank? For this bank? Yeah, I think I would. Okay. But the right bank. Right the bank. The right bank is right near a street. Would we say and that riparian zone very small. Like three or four meters, you think? Yeah, like three. Three meters. Like three. Okay. If so that. I would get maybe like a one for that, right? Yeah. All right. So now we add up all of our scores. Let's see. Now. This would be a good activity for the kids at home. Oh yeah, for <laughs> kids at home. <laughs> Practice you, your were you writing math down moment. the scores as we were going? <laughs> So 15 plus 17 plus 20 mm -hmm. plus 19 plus 20. We had some really good scores on that side. And this side's not as good. Then we have plus 15 plus 15 plus 3 plus 7 plus 7 plus 3 plus 10 plus 1 equals 152. So, and we have a little key here at the bottom. It gives us our habitat scores, and there's different ranges. So optimal is 160 to 200. Suboptimal is 110 to 159. Marginal is 60 to 109. And poor is less than 60. So we have a 152, which scores us in the suboptimal range. At the high end of suboptimal. Yeah, pretty good. <laughs>